Welcome to this week's weekly webinar where we're going to be covering some of the common dragonflies that you would find in the state of Texas. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County. So before we get started, I would like to let you know about a type of resource that is really excellent if you are into navigating and identifying some of the common dragonflies in Texas. And that is a field guide called Dragonflies of Texas. I have been able to find this field guide at HEB at the checkout line. You can find it at lo your local nursery a lot of times. And I'm sure you can find it online. I'm sure you can find it through Amazon. But it's a fabulous resource that provides a good pictorial key of some of our common dragonflies and shows you the difference between the males and the females and also shows you where you can find them um, what kind of habitats they have and when you find them around in uh, throughout uh, Texas what their seasonality is and when they're more common if you look at where dragonflies fall in the grand scheme of living things and especially within the group of insects the class of insects the order odonata is what makes up all of our dragonflies and damselflies and then in the suborder, we have Anisoptera, which are the dragonflies, and Zygoptera, which are the damselflies. And while we do have a good number of damsel, damselflies in Texas, I am really only going to be talking about dragonflies. But the biology of the dra dragonfly and damselfly is pretty similar. We know that dragonflies have evolved from a very ancient group of arthropods. They've been on the earth for a very long time, and their ancestors have been around for a very long time. We have Good fossil records that do show and prove this. We believe that they existed on the earth or at least their ancestors existed about 325 million years ago. The difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly is the way that their body is shaped and also the way that they hold their wings. So a dragonfly when it's at rest will rest with its wings outstretched. A damselfly at rest will rest with its wings closed together over its back, folded over its back. The dragonfly is also quite a bit uh, more bulky and the damselfly is thinner, has a more slender body. And the way that the dragonfly holds its wings out, making it a much bigger object and easier type of prey to grab onto, tells us that it is an older organism than damselflies are. It's been on the earth older, longer. And so damselflies are believed to have evolved from a common ancestor later than the dragonflies did. They have the ability and the muscle to fold those wings over their body and they become smaller, so they're less likely to be attacked and grabbed by a predator. But they do not have the ability to fold them totally flat against their back, like say a cockroach or, or uh, beetles or other insects do. And so that tells us they are still pretty primitive and there are other insects that are younger than them in the grand scheme of things. But damselflies are considered younger than dragonflies because they have that adaptation to be a little bit smaller and they have the muscles to fold those wings back behind the body when they're at rest. Dragonflies have a number of funny names. They have been known to be called mosquito hawks, snake doctors, devil's darning needles. There's about 3,000 species worldwide and we ha are lucky to have 142 of those species in Texas. I'm not going to be covering all 142 species. We're really just going to be covering maybe 10 or so that are really common to the central Texas area and or are common uh, across the Texas state. So if you look at the life cycle of a dragonfly, we do call it an incomplete life cycle. The dragonfly mother lays, after she mates with the male, she will lay her eggs in the water. They will turn into, the eggs hatch and turn into something that we call naiads, which look very much like the adult, but do not have wings and are found solely in, underneath the water. They're an aquatic organism. And then they'll climb out of the water and become the adult. So it's an incomplete life cycle with only three stages. When they go from egg to adult, they, the mating occurs close to the water, so you always find dram, damselflies and dragonflies close to a body of water. She will insert her abdomen, lay those eggs there, and they molt a series of times, about three different times, growing each time that they molt, feeding on things under the, the, the water surface. And then they'll find some vegetation, climb out, and emerge. So they really do prefer, most species prefer, water that has a good amount of vegetation so that they are able to cling to it to dry out and then emerge as an adult. 
The babies are considered lion weight predators. Your damselfly is there on the left-hand side and the dragonfly is on the right-hand side. They can move through something called jet propulsion. So if they need to get away from a predator or something that is frightening them, they will actually fill their body full of water and push it out their rear end. And so they will jet propel themselves through the water to, to be able to move quite a bit faster than their prey is. And the way that they copulate is really kind of unique. Dragonflies and damselflies will actually grab on, the male grabs onto the female by the back of her head, and if she accepts the male, then she will lift the tip of her abdomen up to the base of the abdomen of the male, and that's where copulation occurs. So you have probably seen this quite often when you've been on a lake or you've been close to any body of water because they will fly during their copulation also. So the male end and the female end are actually located in two different spots um, on each uh, species respectively. The dragonfly diet is is mainly meat. That's really all that they eat. They are not herbivores in any way. They are carnivores and they will feed on other insects. They are also known to feed on, on other little vertebrates like the naiad there is feeding on a fish under the water. And they feed on all sorts of stuff. They do not only feed on harmful insects. They like to feed on anything that they can catch on the fly. So mosquitoes can be a good part of their diet since they're also located close to water. But they're also known to feed on things like monarch butterflies or other beneficial insects, maybe bumblebees. They're not really specific about what they feed on, but that is still okay. There's still a need for predators in the environment, even if they're feeding on something that we consider to be beneficial. They're still helping keep the insect population in check. So let's get into some of the families of our dragonflies. I mentioned that the dragonflies are in the order Odonata. And then below order, the, mo the next most um, descriptive thing in taxonomy is a family. So it goes from order to family. And we have a family called Petaluridae. And these are the graybacks. There's about 11 species worldwide, but we only have one of those in the state of Texas, and it's mainly found in the East Texas Piney Woods. So they really like seeps in deciduous forests. And if you think about it, the Piney Woods in East Texas are really where we have the most deciduous type forests. We don't see that kind of stuff in West Texas or even Central Texas. So this is a very old ancient dragonfly family, kind of very pretty, um, gray and, and black in color. All of our dragonflies are very can be very colorful and very very um, interesting to look at, but after they die, they'll just turn dark. They don't, they kind of lose that pretty color to them. So a lot of people like to take pictures of dragonflies as opposed to collecting them because in the end, they all pretty much look the same. The darner dragonflies, which are a very common and kind of widespread, a large group of dragonflies are in the or order Odonata, of course, but the family Ashinidae. And one of the ways that we identify dragonflies families from other families is we look at the veins and the shape that the veins make in the wings. So if you look at the dragonfly's wings here, they have this triangle in the front wing and in the hind wing. And the fact that those are in, those are similar size to one another tells you that they're in this order Ashinity. But also you can look at the eyes. The eyes will touch from the tip of the eye close to the mouth to nearly the back of the head. So that's characteristic of, of our darners. These um, are the largest and the most powerful dragonflies. We have some that will migrate. They're very, very strong flyers, and they're very, very large in size. The green darner is one of those that does migrate. They prefer to live in still waters and temporary pools, and they're a green color. The males almost always have a prettier coloration to them than the females do. The males are more blue, are more green, and the females, if you if you were to collect one, definitely has more of a blue coloration to it. Each fall and spring, though, they will fly across the United States as far as 900 miles on a migration pattern. So we see these guys around this time of year in September, October, and we're and also November, and they're migrating through. While we do have this species, if you notice from the map, in the majority of Texas, the majority of the year, we will see an increase in activity in the summertime and then also again in the fall time. So if you go outside and you're noticing a lot of dragonflies flying around, you're probably seeing these green darners. 
Another really pretty one is called a blue-eyed darner, and this is found in West Texas and Northwest Texas. The blue-eyed darner is blue, has blue eyes, and the whole body is pretty much blue. Female is not quite as blue and striking, but still, um, still does have that color pattern. And then there's a swamp darner, which is found um, in Quana to Corpus Christi. So it's not found throughout the the state of Texas, but it's found um, in areas obviously based by the name that are more swampy. So they like, the swamp darner likes heavily wooded streams, pools, and ponds, and the blue-eyed darner you can find around ponds, lakes, and slow-moving streams if you're in the west or northwest part of Texas. But I thought that these were pretty enough to include um, because just the coloration, that blue color is, to me is just so, so uh, deep and royal. Another family of dragonflies are the gomphidae family, and these are our club tails. So many of the club tails will have a club at the end of their abdomen, but not every species necessarily does. So what we're looking at here is that the, the fore and the hind wing triangles are also similar in size, but they're larger than we saw in the Aeshides. And also their eyes are not touching. So we look for a club, and then we look at the triangle, and then you can also look at the eyes. The eastern ring tail is a type of club, club tail, and you can see there at the end, it obviously has a club to its tail. The very tip of the abdomen is, is enlarged. These are found statewide. They're not a very large uh, dragonfly. They are a little bit smaller, but we find them in streams and rivers with moderate to strong flow. So that is important to know because a lot of times invertebrate, uh, aquatic invertebrate biologists will study the invertebrates that are found in certain bodies of water and even vertebrates as well, but they can tell a story. They can tell you if that water, depending on what species are present, it can tell you if that water is uh, very oxygenated if it's if it's got good flow to it, if it's healthy water versus being more polluted and stagnant water when other species are found. The dragon hunter and the sulfur tipped club tail are two other club tails and you can see by the dragon hunter there they really don't have a club to their tail but the sulfur tip certainly does. And, and I hope that you recognize when you're seeing all of these dragonflies that their coloring is really beautiful. Dragonflies can be very, very beautiful, but again, once you collect them and put them in a collection, they kind of lose that coloration to them. So the dragon hunter is found in South and East Texas from Texarkana to Del Rio. So it's found in a good, good chunk of the, of Texas. They like more forested areas. They like moderate to fast streams and rivers as opposed to the sulfur tail who's found statewide. You find them all over the place except for the piney woods. You do not find them there. And they really like mud-bottomed ponds because the larvae like to hide kind of under the mud um, and sit and wait for their prey to get close. And they're also found in lakes and very slow-moving streams and rivers. Libellulidae are our skimmer, our skimmer dragonflies. And these guys have a little boot shape on their hind wing. So that's how I identify them. And dragonflies are large enough. Their wing venation is, is uh, dark enough that you are sometimes able to snap a picture. And if you get them with their wings outstretched just right, you're able to identify at least what family they're found in. So the skimmers have very erratic flight patterns um, and... Our skimmer's flight pattern is usually pretty erratic and there are a lot of species that are found throughout Texas and there are a lot of species that have very beautiful coloration to them. One of those is the widow skimmer. This one is found statewide and we find it in places where there's permanent marshes, ponds, lakes, and very slow moving streams. So they do not like bodies of water that dry up. They like bodies of water that stick around for a long time. I often find in the San Antonio area the widow skimmers landing on reeds and the tips of vegetation in places where you have a permanent, like a, a, a aquatic garden. So I'll find them at the um, San Antonio Botanical Gardens. Or if you happen to have a koi pond in your backyard, you'll probably find these guys coming around. The 12 spotted skimmer is found pretty much everywhere in Texas except for the deep south part of Texas. And they're called the 12 spotted skimmer because if you count the spots, the black dark spots on their back, and actually even the blue spots, they have 12 dark spots and 12 blue spots, four wings and three spots each of each color. 
They're found in ponds, lakes, and temporary pools and very slow moving streams. So we can find them in spots where they're not necessarily, uh, there's always water there, but when water does become available, then they take advantage of that. The variegated meadow lark is a reddish colored dragonfly and it is found all throughout the state. It really likes very still waters. If it's in moving water, it's very slow moving streams where they are, are not rushed away. And they also like temporary pools. They're abundant in the early spring and in the late fall time. And they are a little bit different from some of our other dragonflies, which like to land on the tips of vegetation. These guys will actually perch on the ground when they, when they rest. And that brings me to a point about dragonflies. If you do want to take pictures of them or collect one, and you can't get a good snapshot of one, wait until you see it land. And especially if it's a male, they're very territorial and they will always come back to the same spot. So if they spend any amount of time on the little stalk of the little grass and they flew around and then came, they will always come back to that spot. If they just land and leave immediately, they may not necessarily come back there, but if they sat there for a moment, you can almost guarantee that they will eventually move back there. A roseate skimmer is a very beautiful looking dragonfly. The males are very rose colored, very pink. That's kind of unusual to see in insects, that kind of pink rosy color. Females more of a reddish or burnt orange. And they are found statewide. You find these guys in ditches and pools and ponds and lakes, places where the water is not moving very quickly. And they're also found in moving streams, but where it's very slow moving. Our eastern pond hawks are also found statewide. The males are green and the females are, well, actually, the, the females are green because if you notice, that male is grabbing onto the female right there. So the males are blue with green eyes and the females are green. They are found around quiet water and also where there's always vegetation found in that quiet water. Common whitetails are uh, found statewide. And if you look closely, you can usually find these. I always have my 4-H kids will turn these into collections, so it seems to be a fairly common dragonfly. If you are, are able to find one around pools, ponds, lakes, and l very low-flowing streams. The blue dasher is a statewide found dragonfly. It's in quiet bodies of water. And what's unique about this one is that when it rests, its wings are depressed. They push them down. Um, and we don't really see that in any other dragonfly. I love the way the Halloween pennant looks. It's found in most of Texas, but not in the Big Bend area, but I figured that it's October right now, and it's an appropriate time to kind of talk about Halloween, and they definitely have a, a fall or a Halloween coloration to them. We find them in marshes and lakes with emergent vegetation. The red saddlebag is another statewide dragonfly that is pretty common. If you find a red dragonfly, most likely it's the red saddlebag that you're that you're you're catching or that you're spotting. And we find them in pools, ponds, lakes, and flow, slow moving streams. But we will have fall swarms of these guys. So if it's if it's fall time and you're seeing a red colored dragonfly, that it's almost a hundred percent guaranteed that you're looking at a red saddlebag. Thank you for joining me for this week's weekly webinar. I hope you have gained an appreciation now for dragonflies. Certainly notice how beautiful and colorful that they can be. There's something that we can, certainly most people can live with dragonflies. Most people do not have an issue with them. So I hope that now you're, you can get out there and do some dragonfly watching and see if you can spot some unusual species in your backyard. My name is Molly Keck and I am with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service.